Have you ever wanted to learn a new language, but just didn't have the time or money? I may have a solution for you. Her name is Jessica, and she gives free Chinese lessons daily at 11 p.m. Beijing time and 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Chinese is fun and easy if you have the right teacher. Let Jessica be that teacher and introduce yourself to the fastest growing language in the international job market today at tinyurl.com backslash tcjessica and tell her Ian sent you. Do you like fine art but think it might be out of your price range? Do you have a vision for a painting that you'd like to see brought to life but you just don't have the skill? I might have a solution for you. Art by Daisy. With decades of experience, Daisy offers high-quality, affordable watercolor paintings suitable for hanging in your home, office, or even as a gift. With prices starting at just $55, visit tinyurl.com backslash artbydaisy to find out more. Hello, and welcome to the Deathcast. I'm your host, author, and journalist, Ian Totten. and I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to take our third look at the crimes of Ted Bundy. Before we get going, as always, I have the normal show notes. If you'd like to follow me on social media, just search for The Deathcast. If you'd like to help support the show, there's two ways you can go about this. First and foremost, you can go to your favorite podcast app, leave a five-star review, and follow the show. You can also go to tinyurl.com backslash dcastpatreon, where for as little as $1.99 a month, you can get access to early ad-free shows just like this one, as well as exclusive episodes covering a variety of different cases you won't hear in the free feed, just like like my friends Channel and Anthony have done. All right, now that all of that's out of the way, find yourself a nice comfy chair, kick back and relax. I've got my coffee. I've got my cigarettes. Let's go in the crypt. When we left off last week, we had been discussing the final known murders that Ted Bundy committed in Washington. That was the double homicide that took place in the state park. And I say that because Bundy was really an enigma in that he did not like talking about some of his murders. Others he would speak about, while many others he just simply ignored as though they did not exist, would refuse to answer questions or would lay the blame off on someone else. This goes for suspected murders but also for murders that it has been confirmed that he did, in fact, commit. Now, we do know that at some point during this point in time, various police departments came together and held a symposium on these crimes, their similarities. And while many of the things that they put together, which eventually made the news, were correct, some were not The main points that the police all agreed on were, quote, each has been wearing slacks or jeans when they disappeared. In each case, detectives had not one single piece of physical evidence that might have been left by the abductor. Construction work was going on each campus when the girls were missing. And in two instances, a man wearing a cast on his arm was seen in the vicinity. Now, the one point that they put out there that was incorrect was that all of the girls were single. Some of these girls had boyfriends. One of them at least had a long-term boyfriend. And this could be chalked up to the fact that the police were not willing to initially add all of these girls to this same list of missing persons, although eventually they would indeed include all of these young women and many many others. Now, we discussed last week the double homicide that took place at Spam Amish Park. There were immediate reactions from the public. Firstly, patrols in the area greatly increased as the police felt that this individual may return to the scene of the crime and continue committing these crimes. Also, 
women became deathly afraid. And this was a fear that would linger, unlike the people who stopped going to the state park. Eventually, they would return as the public memory forgot about what had taken place. The police came to the conclusion that the individual they were looking for was more likely than not very charming, highly intelligent, attractive, and an individual who was above reproach or suspicion. And all of these would, in fact, turn out to be true. However, even armed with this information, the police were no closer to catching the individual responsible for the Ted murders. And in fact, the murders in the area of Seattle simply ceased to happen, and this confounded the police as they were working on a notion that the killer was acting under the phases of the moon when he struck. However, as the next phase of the moon came into play and no attack came, they began to wonder if the killer had not, in fact, left the area for easier hunting grounds. They reasoned that this could possibly be true given the amount of media coverage that this crimes had received and the fact that he, the killer had to be aware that the police were looking for him. However, the police could not be certain of this as in cases like this, a sort of mass hysteria, mass hypnosis overtakes the population and even with no further murders occurring that they're aware of, they are still getting reports of people having seen a suspicious individual who matched the description of the suspect that they were seeking. And as the summer progresses, the police get at least 2,400 suspects of individuals who may in fact be their Ted. One of those names submitted by Anne Rule, as well as other unknown individuals, was in fact Ted Bundy. However, at this point, the police were unable to link him to any of these crimes. On April 10th of 1974, it's known that Ted Bundy officially dropped out of law school. People have often wondered about this cooling off period in the Ted crimes, and it could be multifaceted. We know that he had gotten a job working for an energy commission in the state of Washington, and that this consumed quite a lot of his time. Something that has been pointed out by experts on serial killers as actually having a positive effect on their activities. That's a change in life that diverts their attention and energies away from their true passion. It may also be that Bundy was in fact killing during this period of time and that he simply switched his hunting grounds to another area where people were not looking for him so intently. And there is some evidence to suggest that this may very well have been happening. Ted's work for this commission was said to be sporadic. When he was on his game, he was absolutely amazing. However, he had a tendency to arrive very late in the morning to work or not show up at all, something that his co-workers found distressing. As the summer of 1974 is starting to draw to a close, Bundy begins plans to move to Utah where he's going to be attending law school. And some things were noted about him during this time. His long-term partner stated that Bundy had become cold to her sexually and she began to suspect, in fact, that he was sleeping with other women, something that we know from Ted Bundy's own account and the account of others he was, in fact, doing. Also, people noted Bundy's living quarters, which was really a room inside of a boarding house, 
and the odd objects that he had there, most notably a bicycle wheel that was hanging from chains and a meat hook inside of his bedroom. It's known that a body was found, or rather parts of a body were found near Lake Samish State Park, noticed a disturbing smell. This individual moved away from the area thinking it was a deer carcass. However, the following month in September, hunters would be in the same area and they stumbled upon human remains. These were nothing more than bones. And these bones were eventually identified as being those of Janice Ott and Denise Nashland. And while there were a number of other bones at this site that are suspected to have belonged to other victims, this has never officially been confirmed, nor has the identities of any other possible victims been released to the public. Again, this feeds into the idea that Bundy has other victims that no one knows about. While all this is going on, Ted Bundy leaves the area for Salt Lake City, Utah. The first known victim that Bundy took in Utah was a 16-year-old by the name of Nancy Wilcox from Holiday, Utah. Nancy was last seen on October 2nd riding in a Volkswagen Beetle near her home. She had gone out to buy a pack of gun and was never seen again. Now, according to Bundy, she had been buried near the Capitol Reef National Park, which is some 200 miles south of Salt Lake City. However, no body was ever discovered. On October 18th, another young woman went missing, this time from Midvale, Utah. This was 17-year-old Melissa Ann Smith. Melissa was the daughter of the local chief of police. Physically, she matched the description of many of Ted's other known victims. On the night of October 18th, Melissa had plans to go to a friend's house where there was going to be some sort of party or sleepover. However, she was unable to get this friend on the phone, so instead Melissa headed to a local pizza parlor where she was to meet up with a friend who was going through a rocky point in a relationship with her boyfriend. Melissa and this friend were at the restaurant until roughly 10 that evening. Melissa planned to return home and get her clothing to go over to this sleepover. Melissa was not seen again. However, her body ends up being found on October 26th. Now, this is the first victim of Bundy's who is found quickly. Melissa's Naked body was found on a hillside in Summit Park with her head having been savagely beaten and it was later determined by the pathologist that more likely than not Melissa's head had been bashed with a crowbar and her body was covered with numerous bruises that it was determined had occurred prior to her death. She had also been strangled with a ligature, and it was later determined that Melissa had been raped and sodomized. And at this point, I'm going to point out that Bundy's cooling off periods are growing less and less as the mania that drives him really starts to become all-consuming. In cases such as his, we see this where a serial killer will start to spiral, and when they start to spiral, they get sloppy in their work, 
and they start to make mistakes, but they also start taking victims closer and closer together. So in Utah, we have the first victim, Nancy Wilcox. That's on the 2nd. On the 18th of October, we have Melissa Ann Smith. And then on the 31st, we have a 17-year-old named Laura Ann Amy. Laura disappeared from Lehigh, Utah, where she had been attending a Halloween party. Now, Laura had left the party as she felt that it was lacking in excitement, instead heading to a cafe and then a nearby park. Laura was not reported missing until the early part of November, as she had dropped out of school and was living with friends in American Fork, and it wasn't until her family became concerned after not hearing from her and reached out to her roommates that it was discovered that no one had seen Laura. Laura's body is going to end up being found in the American Fork Canyon on November 27th, which was Thanksgiving Day lying beside a river. She was naked, her body savagely beaten, particularly the head and face, and it was apparent that Laura had been sexually assaulted. She had also been strangled. Back in Washington, Bundy's long-term girlfriend is being confronted by one of her friends who had suggested earlier that Ted Bundy may in fact be the Ted the police are looking for. Now this friend grew up in Utah and had in fact been visiting during this period of time, had seen these newspaper articles and brought them back with her to Washington where she confronted Bundy's girlfriend with the similarities not only in the cases but in the physical description of the girls who had gone missing. And because of this, Ted's girlfriend does in fact contact the police, putting Ted's name yet again within their radar. However, there's just not enough information and too many other suspects for the police to be able to track down Bundy and question him. But Bundy is unaware of all of this as he is still out on the prowl and this is Bundy's very first major misstep. On November 8th, he encounters a young woman by the name of Carol DeRanche who is at the Fashion Place shopping mall in Murray, Utah. Now, Carol had gone there to go shopping and encountered Ted Bundy, who informed her he was an undercover officer investigating break-ins in cars and that her car had been broken into. However, he needed her to come with him to verify that it was, in fact, Carol's vehicle. And Bundy had changed his physical appearance slightly. He, at this point, he had grown out a mustache. And he seemed so matter-of-fact and self-assured that Carol didn't stop to ponder a number of questions. How this man had known the car belonged to her. How, in fact, he had found her in the crowded mall to begin with and why he was not in uniform and did not possess a badge. Carol simply assumed that he was as he presented himself, and she would later state that as they got outside, she felt some apprehension over the situation. However, the man was so in control, she decided to follow him anyways. It's known that Carol asked to see the man's identification, and in, in return, he laughed at her. And they continued on, coming to Carol's car, which she opened and stated that everything was still there. Bundy is known to have told her that his partner had probably already gone back to the station and it would be a good idea for the two of them to go there as well as if his partner had a suspect in custody carol may in fact be able to identify the man 
So Carol Durange agrees to go with the man. They walk to another building where he knocks on the door numerous times and no one responds. And it's at this point that Carol really begins to grow nervous and the man insists to her that they need to go downtown to headquarters so that she can fill out a formal complaint. Again, she demands to see some form of identification, and Bundy flashes her, his wallet at her, and Carol sees the glimmer of what appears to be a badge. So she agrees to head off with the man, growing more apprehensive when they approach his car, a small Volkswagen Beetle. However, Carol had been told that cops especially undercover police officers, often drive around in unusual unmarked cars. And despite her apprehensions, she decides to get in the vehicle with Ted Bundy. Carol Durange stated that after getting into the car, she noticed the overwhelming scent of alcohol, which, again, she found to be very odd, as she didn't believe police officers were allowed to drink while on duty. So feeling that something is off with this situation, Carol Durange sits there contemplating what's going on as Ted Bundy gets into the car and instead of heading to the local police department, drives in the opposite direction out of town. And then Bundy stops the car. Carol Durange said that his entire demeanor had changed, that he was no longer smiling at her, that a hard, cold look had come across his features, and that he was staring at her. Knowing that something is about to happen, Carol tries to flee the car and is stopped by Bundy, who puts a handcuff on her wrist. A fight breaks out, and during this fight, Bundy is attempting to place the handcuff on Carol's other wrist, and Carol Durange is screaming for her life at this point, fighting furiously, and Bundy pulls a gun, telling her, Quote, if you don't stop screaming, I'm going to kill you. I'll blow your brains out. And miraculously, at least according to Carol Durange's later statements, the door that she had tried to open had in fact unlocked. And in this brief respite from his assault, she leaned back against this door and fell out into the night. Bundy ends up grabbing what she assumes is a crowbar, grabbing her and slamming Carol against the side of the car. A struggle ensues. Carol attempts to kick Bundy in the testicles, manages to break free and run off. A couple driving nearby see this frantic woman with the handcuff on her wrist running towards them. The couple eventually let Carol into the car when they notice that she's terrified and sobbing, saying over and over again, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. When Carol then informs them that this man is going to kill her, the couple realize that they have more likely than not just stumbled onto something major, and it's decided that the police need to become involved. It's at the police station that Carol informs them that a man calling himself Officer Roseland had assaulted her. Officers go to the site of the attack and find nothing except for one shoe, which Carol Durange has left behind. From this attack, officers get a number of things. A good description of of the would-be murderer, a description of his vehicle, the weapons that were used, but they also get blood from this man as Carol Durange finds blood on her jacket lining, and it's determined that it is 
blood type O, however, there is so little of it at this point in time that with the limited DNA processing that they had, they were unable to determine whether it was O positive or O negative. What happens next gives us further evidence to the idea that Ted Bundy was, in fact, by this point, spiraling. After Carol Durant escapes, he flees the scene. Instead of returning home, Bundy travels to the town of Bountiful, Utah. A 17-year-old high school student by the name of Deborah Jean Kent had gone with her family to attend a musical at the local high school. It's known that the head of the drama department, a young woman within the age range of Bundy's preferred victims, was approached by a stranger wearing a sport coat, slacks, patent leather shoes, and sporting a mustache and that this man asked if she would accompany him to the parking lot to help identify the car. The woman, who was extremely busy at this point as she prepared to send her students out to perform this play, politely declined the man's request and continued on with her duties. However, the man continued to pester her for a few moments, and she would later state that the man stared at her in a way that she found unsettling. However, as she was in the midst of all of this chaos, she could not do anything about him at the moment. Bundy continued to pester her before the woman mentioned her husband, and then it appears that he left her alone. During intermission, several people saw Bundy in the back of the auditorium as though restless. So Debbie Kent, at some point during the play, lets her parents know that she's going to go pick her brother up from the roller skating rink and that she'll be back to get them when the play concludes. Later, residents would tell the police that at some point between 10.30 and 11 o'clock that night, they heard two loud, piercing screams that appeared to be coming from the high school parking lot. Some of the witnesses stated that the cries were so distressing, they had actually walked out of their homes to see if they could see what was going on, although there was nothing for them to see. Debbie's brother ends up stranded at the bowling alley as his sister never arrives while her parents exit the play to find not only is their car still in the parking lot but there is no sign of debbie or their youngest child and eventually they realize that something is gravely wrong when by midnight debbie has not appeared and they contact the bountiful police department explaining the situation to them and it's from all of this that officers learn of the strange, handsome man with the mustache, the cries that the neighbors had ear witnessed, and after extensive searching, the police made one small discovery, and that is a handcuff key which was found near one of the exterior doors to the school leading out to the parking lot. Obviously, this sets off alarm bells in the officers' minds. This leads the officers to head to the Murray Police Department and try the key and the pair of handcuffs that had been on Carol Durancha's wrists. And unsurprisingly, the key fits and opens the cuffs. A lot of people came forward to claim having seen things on that night. One of the most startling was a parent who claimed they had arrived at the school at around 10.30 on the night of November 10th and had seen a light-colored VW bug racing from the parking lot. On a personal note for Ted Bundy, his first year in law school was going terribly. And this can 
in hindsight, be linked directly to the murders that were taking place in Utah as any ideas that Bundy had once had of pursuing a career in either politics or in law were really gone by this point. He existed simply to prey on young women. And because of this, it was an all-consuming thing for him. And the mask of normalcy is really starting to slip from him at this point. In December of 1974, there was a national conference of law enforcement professionals held in Las Vegas. And it's at this conference that the Washington State Police reveal what they know about the crimes they are tracking, these mysterious Ted murders that seem to have stopped. While cops from Utah discussed the cases that they had on the books. Around this point in time, Bundy's girlfriend, Elizabeth Klopfer, actually contacts authorities in Salt Lake City putting forth the idea that her boyfriend may in fact be responsible for these crimes. As had happened in Washington, Bundy's name was added to a massive list of suspects. It's known that Bundy returned to Seattle at some point around Christmas and that he and Elizabeth spoke briefly of marriage. It appears that Bundy went into a cooling off period after the attempted abduction and murder of Carol Durantia and the successful murder of Deborah Jean Kent, who it should be pointed out was never fully recovered, although Bundy did inform the police many, many years later that he had left her near Fairview, Utah, which was uh, roughly 100 miles south of Bountiful. A bone was discovered at this site and was later linked via DNA as belonging to Deborah Kent. And this was in 2015. This cooling off period is more likely than not a self-imposed one where the urge simply was not there but more a situation where outside stressors kept Bundy from committing any further crimes. You, he had finals at school, and again, school already was not going well. He is struggling to maintain this prosana that he has created. He is also traveling back to Washington to see Elizabeth. This dormant period would only last until January 12th of 1975. 23-year-old Karen Campbell was vacationing in Aspen, Colorado from her home area of Farmington, Michigan. Karen was a registered nurse who was engaged to be married to a doctor who was also with her on this trip, as was this man's two children from a previous marriage. We know that her fiancé had planned to attend a medical symposium that was also taking place while they were in Aspen, and that they had checked in on January 11th that there was some fight between the two of them over... Karen wanting to get married as soon as possible and her fiancé being reluctant to do so, which is understandable given the fact that he had previously been married and was not exactly joyous over the prospect of undergoing all of that again. However, it does not seem that this was a major fight, more of a lover's tiff. We also know that Karen was suffering from the flu on the day that they checked into the hotel. On January 12th, the couple, along with the doctor's children, attended a dinner with mutual friends, after which they returned to the lounge in their hotel, 
where they plan to just kind of hang out and enjoy one another's company with her fiance reading a paper and Karen remembering that she had a brand new magazine in their suite leaving to get that at some point after they had arrived. Here's what we know. A number of doctors who were familiar with Karen saw her get off the elevator. These same doctors apparently spoke to her briefly as she made her way to room 210. We also know that some period of time passed before her fiancé finished reading the newspaper, realized that Karen was not with them any longer. Leaving his children in the lounge, this man returns to their room and knocks, expecting Karen, who had the only key to the suite, to answer. However, she did not, and this, of course, makes the man become concerned. Thinking that his fiance may have gotten sicker, the man goes down to the front desk to request help gaining access to their room. Upon being let into the room, the man noticed two things. Karen's purse was not inside the room, but the magazine she had gone up to get was. Figuring that she may have run into friends of theirs and decided to attend a party, this man then goes back to the lounge for a few minutes to make sure that everything is well with his children. Before he begins to investigate the rest of the hotel, trying to locate her. Obviously, you can see where this is going. Karen is nowhere to be found. And he eventually contacts the Aspen police to report her as missing. This is somewhere after 10 p.m., Police end up broadcasting a description of Karen across the radios of officers in the area, describing her as 23 years old, 5 feet 4 inches tall, with brown shoulder-length hair, wearing jeans and a woolly jacket. Now, officers encountered numerous women that evening matching this description. Unfortunately, none of them turned out to be Karen. The next day, the police continue their search, this time focusing on the hotel, and it's during this search that they learn the last time Karen Campbell had been seen was when she exited the elevator and had her brief conversation with the group of doctors. Distraught over this, her fiancé and his children returned to Michigan. On February 18th, a man working along the Owl Creek Road, just a few miles from the hotel, noticed birds circling in the air, figuring that an animal had died nearby. He went to investigate, only to discover the naked body of Karen Campbell. She was badly beaten, there were stab wounds, and the snow around her body was stained a dark red with her blood. Officers noted that there had been a fair amount of animal predation and that it was apparent she had been sexually assaulted. Although this could not be conclusively proven as there was no visible traces of semen or of violent sexual intercourse due to animal predation. On March 1st, 1975, two college students were out working on a forestry project at a place called Taylor Mountain when they made a rather disturbing discovery, that of skeletonized human remains. Now, Taylor Mountain is off of Highway 18 and is in between Auburn and North Bend, Washington. It is also roughly... 10 miles from the site where bodies had been discovered earlier. Now, these two students were working on this kind of mini mountain when they discovered a human skull, which would later be determined to belong to Brenda Ball, who was the young girl leaving the tavern 
last seen speaking with the well-dressed, handsome young man with his arm in a sling. No other bones pertaining to Brenda were discovered. However, multiple fractures were present on her skull. On March 3rd, officers made another discovery, that of a second human skull. This one was estimated to be about 100 feet away from where Brenda's had been found. This skull was later determined to belong to Susan Rancourt. Another skull found was that of Roberta Parks. Linda Ann Healy was also discovered at this site. Although only her lower mandible was able to be used in order to confirm her identity. Now all of these skulls bore similar fractures indicating to the officers that there had been some form of blunt force trauma. The discovery of these skulls really fired up the imaginations of people living in the state of Washington, making some speculate that a satanic cult or witchcraft coven was involved in these crimes. Police really didn't delve too deeply into any of these flights of fancy. They simply believed that Bundy removed the victims' heads and brought them there as a macabre shrine. Now, Bundy would later state that the victims' entire bodies were brought up to Taylor Mountain and that he would go back often and have necrophilic sex with the victim's bodies, but that he would also destroy their bodies even further. While that is possible, it does not really explain why only the skulls and a few small pieces of neck bones were discovered at the site. It is highly improbable that the bodies of four fully grown adults were carted off by animals in such a manner that no trace of them has ever been found and is instead more probable that Bundy disposed of his victims' remains elsewhere and only brought the skulls and portions of the neck with him to this site. The detectives began to suspect that they will never solve these crimes as they had seemingly stopped but in Utah, they had stopped as well, although Bundy had himself not stopped. He would simply shifted his hunting grounds for the time being to Colorado, where in March he struck again, this time on the 15th, taking one of his oldest known victims, a 26-year-old by the name of Julie Lyle Cunningham. Julie re lived in Vail, sharing an apartment with a friend of hers and working as a clerk in a sporting goods store. As the story goes, Julie was basically being used by the various men who came in and out of her life. And on the evening of March 15th, having felt down over the disillusionment of her last relationship, spoke to her mother before deciding to head to a local tavern. Julie never arrived at the bar, and when her roommate, who had been at the tavern, came home hours later, she was surprised to discover that all of Julie's possessions were still in the house, except for the clothing that she had worn when she left. Julie's body was never found. On April 6th, 24-year-old Denise Lynn Oliverson left her home in Grand Junction, Colorado, intending to bike over to her parents' house. Now, Denise was married and had just had an argument with her husband, so she was going over to her parents' house, planning on winding down and, you know, expressing to them just what the nature of the issue was between her and her husband. However, Denise never arrived. 
Her parents had had no idea what Denise was on her way over, and her husband assumed that she was still angry with him, and because of this, it wasn't until Monday that anyone began looking for Denise after he called the parents home trying to discover her location, only to be told that she had never been there. Police searched the area, eventually finding Denise's shoes and sandals lying underneath a viaduct close to a railroad trestle. Denise was never found, although Bundy would say many years later that he had thrown her body into the Colorado River, which, if true, does make some semblance of sense as the Colorado River was very close to where Denise's bike and shoes were found. Bundy's next confirmed victim was a 12-year-old girl from Pocatello, Ohio. This was Lynette Dawn Culver, who vanished on May 6th after leaving Alameda Junior High School for her lunch break. As with the previous victims, no sign of Lynette Culver has ever been found. For those who are familiar with Bundy, you probably hear me skipping over a few cases at this point, and there is reason for that. Those victims cannot be confirmed as having been the targets of Ted Bundy, and because of that, they're going to get their own episode separate to the episodes where we discuss his known verifiable victims. Now, the next young woman to go missing was a 15-year-old by the name of Susan Curtis. Susan had been at a youth conference at Brigham Young University when she and friends decided to walk back to their dormitory. She was never seen again, and although Bundy gave a generalized location for where her remains could be discovered, no sign of Susan Curtis has ever been found. We can really see the spiraling of Bundy during this point in time as for the majority of his murders, he has had a very established pattern and routine. The routine being that he pretends to be something that he is not in order to gain these women's trust or at least get them to put down their defenses, his age range has remained fairly consistent up until these last few murders. That age range is roughly 17 to 22, 23 years old. But as his compulsion to take lives takes firmer and firmer control of him, he now is just looking for any victim that is readily available for him to target. And because of this, and the fact that Bundy is now feeling nearly invincible in his ability to get away with these crimes, he is becoming more and more daring with the things that he is prepared to do in order to obtain victims, but also in his capturing of them, going outside of his normal established pattern of these older women and going after children, Forgetting the fact that it is much more likely for a child to be reported as having gone missing or abducted than it is for a 22 or 23 year old to be reported as such. Because of this, he's kind of got blinders on as to what is really going on. And this is going to cause Bundy to come to the notice of the police. It's known that during this period of time, Bundy continued to keep up this masquerade of normalcy, bringing friends of his from Washington out to visit, and in one memorable encounter, bringing them all to a gay nightclub, which seems to have shocked the entire group. Bundy 
is known to have returned to Washington during this period of time, taking time off from his job as a security guard to help his old landlords and also to visit with Elizabeth, who later stated that they made plans during this visit not only for her to go to Utah to be with him, but also to marry at somewhere around the Christmas season of 1975. Bundy himself has said that during this period of time, he noted that his drinking was becoming habitually worse, and more and more often he found himself heavily intoxicated out and about looking for women to prey upon. This is not unusual to see among killers of this type. They have a chemical dependency oftentimes, and you know you can lay it on whatever it is that you want to. My personal belief is that these killers uh, develop these addictions in an effort to mask and numb the nothingness that they feel. And that by taking these substances, whether it be alcohol or illicit drugs, it at least allows them to feel something, to feel somewhat normal. We also know from a number of these individuals like Ted Bundy that the ingestion of these substances allows them to lower their inhibitions so they can go out and do the things that they were created to do, as abhorrent as that is. On August 16th, at roughly 2.30 a.m., a member of the Utah Highway Patrol by the name of Bob Hayward was sitting in his patrol car not too far from his house when he saw a light-colored Volkswagen bug drive by. Hayward later stated that there was something about this vehicle that made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. As Hayward was very familiar with this area, again, he lived right nearby and knew the majority of the people who lived in the area, which was residential, but he also knew the cars that these people drove. And for whatever reason, Officer Hayward decides to check this vehicle out, pulling out behind it, turning on his high beams, in order to see the license plate of the car, only for the vehicle to turn off its headlights and speed off. The officer gives chase. Eventually, the car pulls into an old gas station, and the driver of the vehicle steps out, walks to the rear of the car, smiles at the officer, and says, quote, I guess I'm lost. There's a brief exchange where Bundy gives over his driver's license to the man, claiming to have been over to a nearby movie theater where he watched a film, The Towering Inferno, before becoming lost on his way home. The officer knew that this film was not playing at that particular theater, and again, that sixth sense that so many police officers had went off and he realized that this man was lying to him for some reason. The officer is speaking with Bundy as more patrol officers come up. Someone notices that the passenger seat inside of the car has been removed and is laying in the back seat. This again sets off warning signals for Officer Hayward and he requests permission to search Bundy's vehicle. Bundy consents to this, and the officers began going through his car, quickly discovering a crowbar on the floor behind the driver's seat. He also found a bag inside, and inside of this bag was a number of items that greatly distressed the officer. A ski mask, another crowbar, an ice pick, rope, and wire. And Ted Bundy ends up being placed under arrest for evading an officer. That's the outside charge. The real charge is now the officers are thinking he may in fact be 
have been out looking for homes to break into. Bundy later claimed that he did not give the officers permission to search his vehicle and that they had, in fact, bullied him into allowing them to do this. And be that as it may, officers took a much harder look inside Bundy's vehicle. In addition to the items already mentioned inside of the bag, they also discovered a second mask made from a pair of pantyhose with eye holes ripped into the fabric, along with a pair of handcuffs. In the trunk of the car, they discovered large green plastic trash bags, and the officers start questioning Bundy about all of this stuff. He claims that it's just things that he found around his house. It's at this point that Bundy is informed that he is being arrested on suspicion of possession burglary tools. Bundy ends up getting bail and released on personal recognizance, which means they don't believe he's a flight risk. It's this arrest that really is the beginning of the downfall of Ted Bundy. One of the officers working at the Salt Lake City Police Department is looking at the arrest records and notices the name of Ted Bundy. After thinking about it, he realizes that Ted Bundy is a name that has been mentioned to him before, as Bundy's girlfriend, Elizabeth, had contacted the Salt Lake City Police Department and stated that her fiancé, Ted Bundy, may be responsible for the crimes that were taking place in the state of Utah. And the officer looking through all of this is now really suspicious. He starts looking at the items inside of Bundy's car again and realized that they might not be looking at a burglary kit, but something much more sinister, which would later come to be termed by the FBI as a kill kit. The main item that disturbed the officer were the handcuffs. As this officer had been involved with the Carol Durancha investigation, and he reasoned that two men driving around in Volkswagen bugs carrying handcuffs with them was a very slim to non-existent chance, and that he very probably had found the individual who had attempted to kidnap Carol. Bundy is arrested again on August 21st, again for possession of burglary tools. He gives reasonable explanations as to why he has a number of these items. The handcuffs, Bundy states that he had found them in a dumpster, and the pantyhose mask he claims was used for added protection underneath his ski mask when he was out skiing. The other items were simply things that, according to Bundy, everybody owned and most people kept inside of their cars. What Ted didn't know is that these officers suspected Bundy not only of being responsible for the attempted abduction of Carol Durancha, but also for the disappearance of a number of women in the area, including but not limited to Nancy Wilcox, Melissa Smith, Laura Aim, Deborah Jean Kent, and Susan Curtis. We are going to end the episode here for the week with Ted Bundy now firmly in the sights of law enforcement in Utah. I hope you have enjoyed this third look at the case. Until next time, The Death Cast is a co-production of Corpse Creek Publishing in association with Big Pond Podcasts. Stay morbid!